All right. Well, today, if you have a Bible, you can turn, turn it to Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we're going to be in verses 20 through 25, and we're not going to start there right away, but I just wanted you guys to be ready, because when we get there, we're going to be there. But I just want to start out this morning by telling you guys another story from when I was growing up. And this occurred slightly after the heart bear incident, but not too long after. I was pretty young, and, and I want to let you guys know that I have a great family. I have an older brother and two younger sisters, and they're all quality. Every single one of them is great, and we all get along very well and have a good time together. In fact, growing up, a lot of the things that we did, we did all together. Whatever one of us did, a lot of times all of us would do that thing. In fact, one of my, or my sisters even, played Little League Baseball with us. They were like the only girls in the whole Little League Baseball League, but because that's just the way our family operated, if someone did something, it seemed like we all did those things, and we got along so well, and even though we did a lot of the same things, we're all different in our own ways. Our personalities are quite a bit different. Some of our mannerisms are different. Some of the things that we like are a little bit different, and I mean all of that in a good way, and I mean this next thing in the best possible way, but my sister Erin is probably the most different of us all. Okay, and I, I do mean that in the most loving and great way, and Erin is excellent, and I always love being around her, but she's very unique. In fact, one of the friends that I have that I've known for a long time, and when you know someone for a long time, a lot of times you end up telling stories from when you grew up or whatever. And I would start off stories and I'd be like, one time, my sister, and he'd be like, wait, 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 Aaron, right? <laughs> like, it seemed like every story that I told that started out with, one time, my sister, dot, 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 was about Aaron. Every single time. And almost always, he was right in guessing that the stories were about Aaron. So I want to tell you a story about my sister, dot, dot, dot. Aaron. Right? Yeah, that was your opportunity to use that, but that's okay. Um, yeah, Aaron, right? I'm going to pretend like you said that. Um, and even though it's about Aaron, it kind of starts off being about my dad, because my dad is great, and one of the things that if you know my dad and if you hang out with my dad very much that you'll realize is that my dad actually loves my mom, which is a good thing. They love each other, and one of the ways that my dad growing up liked to show that he loved my mom was whenever she would leave, he would round us, the children, up and get us to clean. His idea of like giving a great gift to mom was that when she came home from doing whatever she did, our house would be sparkling. You know, the garage would actually have a place to drive the car into, and all the dishes would be done, and in my mind, you know, like every window would be sparkling, and the carpets would be shampooed. No, we didn't do all that, but... Um, but he liked to get us all to like really straighten things up every time that my mom left. That was a gift that he wanted to give to her. So when she came home, she would smile and a theme song would play and it would be like the end of an episode of Full House, if you guys are old enough to know what that is. But, and it would just be great. And needless to say though, we didn't necessarily enjoy the cleaning as much as my mom may have enjoyed the result. In fact, it didn't even really resonate with us why a clean house was better than a messy house. Because we were thinking, well, it's going to get messy again anyway. You know, if you're going to vacuum the floor, but I'm going to walk here again, so what's really the point? It's just going to get messy. We didn't get it. And we thought, well, since that's going to happen, there's just no reason to really clean, right? And Erin, one time, I remember her talking and just being frustrated with it because we knew mom was going to leave and we knew that we were going to get roped into cleaning. And what we would always try and do is get our call our friends and get them to invite us over if we thought that mom was, might try and leave and be like, hey, can I come over to your house and get out of it? But we none of us did. Um, so we were all there and I remember Aaron being like, well, I just don't understand. I, just, I don't know why we always have to clean. Why can't, we, why can't we play? And don't get me wrong, the cleaning that my dad made us do wasn't like slave labor or anything. And actually looking back on it, it was pretty fun. It was good stuff. In fact, he would give us snacks and it was very enjoyable, and it probably didn't go on for like the hours and hours and hours that it seemed like in my mind as a little child, but it seemed that way. So Erin wanted to get to the bottom of the issue, and so she decided to ask the big question. You guys may have used this strategy when you were a kid, but there's one question that seems to always lead to more questions, and that question is, 
why. It's a classic strategy for children to use. You guys can use it sometime on your counselor this week and it will be hilarious to me and frustrating to them. But it normally would go like this. My dad would say, in this situation, it kind of went down. This is a paraphrase, not an exact quote. Um, he would say, okay, everyone, let's do a little bit of cleaning. We'll be done in no time. And he was really, really good at making it seem like we would be done in no time. But Aaron was ready, so she asked, why? And he would be like, so that the house looks nice. And she'd be like, why? And he'd say, so that mom will be happy when she comes home. Why? And he'd be like, well, and it, you know, they just go on and on and on. And you guys may have seen this kind of thing go on and on more than that. You know, she asks why. He says, because she likes a clean house. Why? Because moms like that kind of thing. Why? Because clean houses are nice. Why? Because they look and smell better. Why? Because you cleaned it. <laughs> Why? Because she likes a clean house. Why? Because moms like that sort of thing. Why? Because houses are, clean houses are nice. Why? Because they look and smell better. Why? Because you cleaned it. Why? You know, and it just keeps going on and on and on. There's no end to that. And I'm sure that it didn't exactly go on quite like that. And by that I mean that Aaron probably said it with a little more pizzazz than just why. And uh, my dad probably didn't give those exact answers, but you kind of get the picture. And when the dust kind of settled in this scenario, the answer that ultimately would have been satisfying or was satisfying would be that my mom, that my dad would say, my mom, she does so much for you. She's made your meals since you were, bo you were born. She's given you rides. She's taken care of you when you were sick. She's bought your clothes. She's encouraged you and supported you. She's taken you trick-or-treating, right? She lets you eat ice cream. She brings you to your friend's birthday parties. All those things, and she has always been there for you. And if the question, why, got asked, the answer would be, because she loves you. And boom. That would be the ultimate satisfying answer to why. Why should we clean this house? Why should we do this thing? Why should we serve our mom? And the answer was, ultimately, and the reason that my dad had behind the goal of it the whole time was because she loves you. And I think that that answer, I'm not sure that it necessarily satisfied small Aaron, and I'm not sure that it would have satisfied any of us, but in reality, that is the, the good and right answer, that we do these things because of love, because our mom loved us, we, could, we wanted to show that we loved her in a way that was good and meaningful for her. And that's not too far off from the reasoning that we find about following God in Deuteronomy chapter 6. So we're going to go and start looking at verse 20 now. Verse 20 says, In the future your children will ask you, what is the meaning of these laws, decrees, regulations that the Lord has set up, that the Lord our God has commanded us to obey? What is the meaning of all these laws and decrees that the Lord our God has commanded us to obey? In other words, they're asking this question and saying there are going to be times when people are asking this question, why do we want to obey? Why do we want to follow the laws that God has given to us? Why? Why are we doing this? And thankfully, the next few verses actually supply us with the answer. The next few verses tell us why, when people ask, why do you obey these laws? Why do you follow and obey God? The answer is right here, starting in verse 21. It says, Then you must tell them, We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt by his strong hand. The Lord did miraculous signs and wonders before our eyes, dealing with terrifying blows against Egypt and Pharaoh and all his people. He brought us out of Egypt so he could give us this land he had sworn to give our ancestors. And the Lord our God commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear him so he can continue to bless and preserve our lives and he has done, as he has done to this day. For we will be counted as righteous when we obey all the commands the Lord our God has given to us. And so we can see here that the why, the why that God has given for his commands is that the law points to this story. The regulations from God point to this awesome rescue performed by God. The Lord brought us out. 
And so he's given us these commands, and that's why we obey them. He's given us this mighty and awesome salvation, and that's why we want to follow him. That's why we want to belong to him. And when the children were set free from bondage in Egypt, when they came out of slavery, they made their way into a foreign land and into a place that God had promised to them. And in that new place, they came into contact with people who were not aware of who God was. It wasn't like they were going into an uninhabited country so they could have a brand new fresh start, but they were going into a place where there were people who, who worshipped other gods, who had built altars to idols. And beyond that, there was children being born to them who had not seen all the mighty things that God had done. They hadn't seen God's ultimate rescue for them out of Egypt. They didn't know. They hadn't seen that happen. They weren't aware that God was the God who saves. They didn't know that he could crush the most powerful nation in the world with just ease, without even stressing or stretching or doing anything. Nothing is hard for God. And, and the young people and the people they were coming in contact with hadn't seen that. And they didn't know that God could separate the seas at will. They hadn't seen salvation in action, but the law, the commands of God, opened up the doors for God's people to share about who God was because it allowed them to share about what God had done. And it was the law that would cause them to be able to tell the story that the mighty God had rescued them. And so the verse asks, what is the meaning of these laws, decrees, and regulations that the Lord our God has commanded us to obey. And the meaning is this, that God saves and that God loves. And there's nothing that stands in the way of his love. And there's nothing that stops him from accomplishing his salvation. No king, not even at that time, no one could match the power of God. And no one could stop his love. And no one could thwart his desire to save. And we can see that God brought his people out of this helpless and desperate situation. And he did it, these verses tell us, by his strong hands. I mean, just think about how God brought his people out of Egypt. He sent in a seeming nobody who, who couldn't even speak right to tell the mightiest king in the world that he just needed to let all of these slaves who were doing all of his work for him, needed to just let them go, which is crazy. I mean, that didn't make any sense. And yet, God had called them to do that. And so he was with these men as they went. And he supported what they told the Pharaoh by, by bringing these huge plagues, the likes of which the world had never, never seen before, in order to confirm that he was God and that he had power over everyone. And he did that. He did these mighty things. And eventually the people were set free. And then he, he split the Red Sea in two so that his people could walk through it safely. That's miraculous. He defeated the, the Pharaoh's army. He led the Israelites, who weren't soldiers, remember, they were slaves. And he, he led them to defeat armies along the way, people who wanted to harm them on their way to their promised land. And he led them. He was actually with his people. And by his own strong hand, he led his people out. And not only did he lead with his strong hand, but he led them to a new life in a new land. He led them out of slavery to freedom in a good place. He took them out of one of the worst possible situations where they didn't even own themselves into a place where they would have a wonderful land where they would be free to live and to worship the Lord and to point other people to the goodness of God freely. And he did this so that he would be able to continue to bless them. And that's why he showed his people the law. That's why he gave them the law, in order to bless them. His love for them didn't stop when he rescued them, but by giving them the law, he was able to continue to bless them throughout their lives by showing them how to be with him, how to walk with him, how to live their lives in a way that pleased him. And this is very similar to our story. As people, we, we may have not ever been slaves in Egypt, but the Bible tells us that we were slaves to sin. And we share the same outline of this story with the ancient Israelites, except our version is much more drastic. Because like I was saying, we were slaves to sin, and just like them, we've, we've been set free by God through the good news, through the gospel. 
And the reality is that in our situation, God didn't send anyone to save us, but He Himself came down and lowered Himself and humbled Himself down here amongst broken and sinful, hurting, <coughs> ugly people like you and me who make mistakes, who lie and cheat and steal and lust. He came down to live among people like that in order to save them. And He didn't just live with us, but He died for us. He willingly chose to give up His own life to pay the price for our sins on the cross, not because of anything that we do, can do, or have ever done, but because He is good and because His love for us has no equal. And, and He has done all of that for us in order to set us free from sin. And the best part of that story is that in order to set us free and to show us the promise that we have a new life just like He promised a new life and a new land to the people of Israel, He rose from the dead to, to show us, to confirm to us that when He says you can have life that lasts forever, that death won't control your destiny, He confirmed that He had power over, over death by rising from the grave. And God has given us His word for the same reason that He gave the Israelites His law in order to show that He saves and in order to show that He loves. And we can see that nothing stands in the way of His love, not even ourselves. There's a famous passage from the end of Romans 8 that says, I am convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so for believers, this tells us that Christ, that God, has overcome everything that stood in our way in order to rescue us, including our broken and sinful selves. He brought us out of a hopeless and helpless and desperate situation in order to give us new and good life. In fact, in Romans 5, it says that when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us, while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of His Son, while we were still His enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of His Son. So now, we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God, because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. And He did all of this for us, just like he did for the Israelites. We said that he saved them by his mighty and strong hand. Well, he's done that for us. By his ultimate and incomparable power, he has saved us. In fact, at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, it says, death doesn't have any sting anymore. The thing that, that no person has ever been able to conquer and that, that comes at the end of all of our lives, death itself, the thing that we just have no seeming control over. It owns all of us. But because of the power of Christ, he says that doesn't have any sting. That doesn't have, death doesn't have any victory anymore because God is greater than that. He has saved us by his strong hand. And he's done it to give us a new life in a new land. He's promised us heaven. In fact, in John chapter 14, Jesus says to his disciples that he's made, going to make it a perfect place for us because he wants to be with us forever. Now to me this is one of the greatest things that has ever been said about love because I like to be around a lot of people but there's not necessarily a lot of people that I like to be around all the time. You know eventually someone gets on your nerves. Eventually when you're around somebody um, you just you're like okay I love you and everything but just need a little space, you know. If you might have experienced this if you've been on like a road trip with like your family or something, and you might love your family, but like after 
like a few hours, you're like, this is the line. Don't come across the line. Did you guys have the line when you were kids? The line is very important. Um, but even if you love people, you didn't want to be around them all the time. But what Jesus says to us is that he loves us so much that literally there isn't one second between now and forever that he doesn't want to be with you. He loves you so much that he does not want to miss a moment of being with you. Whether that means being with you here on earth, and you know who you are. You know that a lot of times we're not the most lovable, the most perfect, the people that someone would want to be around all the time. But God's love for us is so great that he wants to be with us forever. And, and he's created us a place in heaven with him where he will perfect us and make us new and set all things right. And the reason that we're invited to be there is because he wants to be with us forever. He doesn't want to be away from you for one second. He wants to give you this new life in a new place, heaven, with him. And he wants to continue to bless you. Just like with the Israelites, his love didn't stop when he rescued them from Egypt. His love for you doesn't stop when you accept that, that he died for your sins on the cross. But that's just the beginning of a new and great relationship with him that changes everything about your life. And, and he wants to bless you and he wants to be with you. And he wants to give meaning and purpose to your life constantly because he loves you. And we've been given the, the word of God so that we can point to the story of Christ by the way that we live our lives. It makes a huge difference. The way that we live our lives really does point to who Jesus is and does point to what he's done. Philippians 2 says this. It says, Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. What this says is that by the way that we live our lives, we will stand out like bright and shining stars, unmistakable no one can miss it. If you live your life in the way that pleases God, it stands out and it points to Him, shining like bright lights and pointing to the fact that God has changed you. And we're able to point to the amazing truth of the gospel when our lives follow the design that God has called us to live by. And the way that other people that can see that God is real and see that God is working in the world today is by seeing that he's real and working in your life today. And there's a lot of question about whether or not God is real in our culture. There's a lot of question about, is God like a crutch for weak people? Or is God a figment of our imagination? Or is God part of this epic, mythic fairy tale that's lasted for thousands of years that we finally need to like shake free from? And people think that. And the fact is, a lot of times they think that because they don't see him working. And given, a big part of the reason that people don't see God working is because they're blinded to it and they don't want to see it. But the other side of the coin is that maybe they don't see God working because they don't see him working in our lives. Because we're not following him. Because we're not seeking him. Because we're not serving him. Because we're not honoring him by following his word as he's called us to do. If you want other people to see that God is alive and real and working and real and working in your life. And this is beyond important. In verse 21 of the chapter that we were reading in Deuteronomy, it says, when they ask the why question, when they say, why do you follow all these laws? Verse 21 starts out with, you must tell them. It's not like a, uh, well, here's a possible answer. You might go with this one. But the answer is, by the way you live your life, when people say, why are you living the way you do? The answer is because I have a great God who saved me. And I have a great God who loves me. And he's doing mighty things in my life by his strong hand because he wants to be with me. Because there's no one like him. And because he's continuing to reach out and to bless even now in spite of all our failures and mistakes and sins. And so when we live for God, 
we know that we have the opportunity to share that he loves and that he saves. That there's no love that equals his love. So my question for you here at the end of today is, how do you respond to the fact that God has done so much for you? What is your response to the reality that the King of Kings became lowly and died for your sins? Not because you're good, not because you're so amazing, but because He is beyond amazing. What is your response to that? Is it a casual thank you because that gets you into the club and you can come to camps like this and make some friends and say the right things and sing the songs and feel like you're a part of a community? Or is it a strong and deep and meaningful and real thank you because you want to give every single part of your life to God because he gave everything on the cross for you. And I would challenge you guys, don't miss out on the chance to respond to him because he is a God who saves and he is a God who loves and he is the God that we need. You might not think that you need him you might not feel like it all the time, but you do. And we need to respond. So I encourage you this, this week, today, to be thinking about that. What will it look like for you to be following God's word more closely? What will it look like to be walking with him? What will it look like so that your life points to the fact that God is alive and working in you? What will it look like for you to truly live like a son or a daughter of God. Let's pray. Dear Father, we just thank you so much for all that you've done for us. We thank you that you did lay down your life on the cross for our sins. And God, we thank you that you rose and that you've made a place for us. God, your love has no equal. And we ask that you would help us not to take it lightly. That you wouldn't let us hear your message, your word, and not respond by bowing down, and not respond by serving you, and not respond by thanking you with every part of who we are. God, you are so great, and so often we are so poor at following you. But we know that that in your word that you tell us that you're close to the people who are broken hearted and that you respond to the people who repent. And so God, we ask that you would help us to turn to you. That you would fill us up with your spirit. And that you would make us a people who are defined by your great saving love. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much.